Cancer Conversations, a Harold Lever Regional Cancer Center podcast discussing all things cancer and giving you information to improve yours or a loved one's cancer journey. Hello and welcome to Lever Cancer Conversations from the Harold Lever Regional Cancer Center. Today we're happy to welcome Dr. Fatak, MD, board certified by the American Board of Urology, residency at Yale, and a research fellowship at the National Cancer Institute to talk about prostate cancer. Dr. Fatak is a member of the American Urology Association and Society of Urologic Oncology. Today, we'll be discussing prostate cancer, prevention, symptoms, screening, and treatment. Hello, Dr. Fatak, you're very welcome. I wanted to thank you as well as the Harold Lever Regional Cancer Center for having me on this program. So to get us started, let's have you tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. You know, I'm pretty lucky. Uh, I've been in this community now for 20 years as a practicing urologist. I am not originally from Connecticut, but I did my training at Yale New Haven and was pretty lucky to be able to do a research fellowship in Bethesda at the National Cancer Institute, specifically in the urologic oncology branch. And my work there actually centered on better understanding prostate cancer, particularly imaging. Mm. I've been lucky throughout my career, really, to have great mentors and be able to work in great institutions. During my residency, I was rotating through the Waterbury hospitals and I really enjoyed the community and I was pretty fortunate to be offered a job when I finished. And 20 years later, I'm here really enjoying what I do. So in general, what can you tell us about prostate cancer? Aside from Prostate Cancer Awareness Month that's coming up, it's really about men's health. And prostate cancer has unfortunately been at the center of men's health for a long time. And prostate cancer in itself is very controversial and treatment has been uncertain for a very long time. This discussion is really centered around how dangerous is prostate cancer. And there's a lot of emphasis on this notion that one is more likely to die with prostate cancer than die because of prostate cancer. Some of this really came to the national forefront when a government agency back in 2012 really even questioned one of the screening tools that we use, which is the blood test called the PSA. Since that time, this concept that we're over-detecting and over-treating prostate cancer, which really would have been an otherwise inactive disease, has become a real source of controversy. The statement itself was controversial then and still remains controversial, and in fact highlights the real issues facing prostate cancer treatment today. There's confusion out there in the community and certainly on the internet and even among patients themselves, and I'm hoping that today we'll talk a little bit about why this is it's really not all that controversial. And I think maybe the best way to approach that is to take a look and say, hey, listen, what are the statistics? What's the reality of prostate cancer? And do it in, in a way that is accessible to not just people who have initials behind their name. Mm. So the truth is, is that, you know, prostate cancer affects a lot of men in this country. Uh, and it still remains the second leading cause of cancer-specific death. And that means not with prostate cancer, because of prostate cancer. So that's a pretty powerful statement in itself. The disease affects 12% of men, and that's one out of eight men in this country. And in fact, it really is the number one solid organ cancer in men in this country as well. And that actually translates to 270,000 patients will be diagnosed with prostate cancer this year alone. I mean, these are some pretty staggering numbers. But at the same time, you know, the flip side argument is statistically, there's only a 3% risk of dying of prostate cancer in a man's lifetime in the United States. It's a little bit higher for higher risk groups, such as African-Americans, uh, but even that percentage is 6%. So on the one hand, we're diagnosing a whole bunch of prostate cancer. And on the other hand, the risk of dying of that disease is relatively low. So there's this disconnect. And I think that's what's been the, the heart of the controversy behind prostate cancer. But the truth is, while this data is real, prostate cancer still hurts a whole lot of people. And what it highlights is that there's a spectrum in this disease called prostate cancer from less aggressive disease and more aggressive disease. And that more aggressive disease is something we refer to as clinically significant prostate cancer. How would a person know they have prostate cancer? What are the symptoms to look for and who should be screened for prostate cancer? It's a great question. Just from the guidelines and sort of common sense, any man over the age of 50 should be screened. And we can talk about what's involved with screening in a second. But if you have primary relatives with prostate cancer, and the primary relative means either a father or a brother, then, then your risk is a little bit higher. So screening probably occurs a few years earlier, say at 45. 
I think the problem with prostate cancer is, is that it rarely shows any symptoms. And that's why screening, meaning trying to get to a cancer before it becomes symptomatic, is so important. Most men can't feel their prostates. And as a result, you don't have any symptoms like bleeding when you urinate or increasing urinary symptoms like frequency and urgency. These are relatively unusual symptoms when the disease is early. So screening itself becomes really, really important. And then how is prostate cancer actually diagnosed? So I think we start with screening and screening really involves a relatively simple process. And that is a simple blood test, this same blood test called a PSA and a physical exam and that word that most men hate to hear. And that is the DRE, the digital rectal exam. So that starts the process. And I think what we've gotten much better at in urology is using those tools to screen for prostate cancer and then risk stratifying. And that's kind of a weird word, but risk stratifying really allows us as urologists to figure out what is the likelihood of a patient having clinically significant cancer. So it's not an all or none phenomenon. It's not like your PSA value is elevated and wow, we're going to do a prostate biopsy and then we're going to find this cancer and go from there. We now have common sense, if you will, backed up by statistics to say, all right, here is the number. It's a little unusual. And here's your exam. It's a little bit unusual. So this is what your risk is for having prostate cancer. And unfortunately, the only way we can still make a diagnosis is through a prostate biopsy. And the prostate biopsy is a relatively quick invasive procedure that uh, takes little snippets of prostate and allows us to look at that under a microscope and determine what type of cancer you have. That's always been what patients have been somewhat leery of. And again, I think that what we're better at now is figuring out who really needs a biopsy and who doesn't. And we use the blood test as well as the physical exam coupled to really, really advanced imaging, particularly MRI imaging of the prostate to be able to, again, risk stratify a patient into this, who gets a biopsy and who doesn't. And then we can move forward with a office-based biopsy. Alternatively, we could go to the operating room and do a real advanced, we call it a fusion biopsy, where we can use the MRI imaging and really get a targeted biopsy to determine uh, truly aggressive prostate cancer, the cancers we quote unquote should be treating versus the more indolent or less aggressive tumors. That really allows us to, again, make this claim that, listen, prostate cancer hurts a lot of people. We just have to get really good at figuring out which one of these prostate cancers are going to hurt people versus the prostate cancers that are perhaps not as aggressive and can be watched more conservatively. That makes sense. So if a person is then diagnosed with prostate cancer and you determine what stage it is, what are the different types of interventions available at that point? I think you use the the real word to, to start that conversation, that is staging. Staging is a term that we use to figure out if the cancer is still in the prostate or is it spread or, or that word called metastasis. And that's often done with an MRI or a CAT scan. And once we stage a patient, we're able to determine whether it's clinically localized, meaning that the cancer itself is only in the prostate. And if we can determine that, then a couple of factors, you know, patient's age, patient's physical health and other medical conditions coupled to the aggressiveness of that prostate cancer allows us to offer treatments to help these patients come along. Broadly speaking, there are four real options for prostate cancer treatment. I think what we're getting really good at now is this concept of active surveillance. So even if we find prostate cancer, regardless of age, depending on its aggressiveness and depending on its earliness, meaning it's not even identifiable on an MRI, we have started pursuing active surveillance on a lot of these patients, which is uh, non-invasive. We simply watch the tumor and we do periodic exams, periodic blood work, periodic imaging, and we follow the tumor and we let the tumor declare whether it's going to be dangerous or not. Certainly, if it becomes dangerous, we're checking patients at regular frequency, so we won't allow that cancer to get aggressive. And in the best case scenario, we don't have to do anything. So a patient certainly doesn't have to succumb to disease or even have any side effects of the disease itself. And, and so that's the first line of treatment. And it's where we've gotten pretty good at not causing harm, which is our primary charge in medicine. So active surveillance is one. Uh, and then certainly the two more invasive ways of treating cancer of the prostate, which is surgery and or radiation. Surgery is aimed at physically removing the prostate. And once the tumor is out, you're essentially cured, uh, assuming the PSA uh, goes to nothing, and is certainly the best option for the right patient. Typically speaking, they're a little bit younger. Uh, typically speaking, they're a little bit healthier. Radiation is gotten 
extremely good as well and offers very similar long-term survival and is non-invasive. There's no cutting involved. Certainly at the Lieber Cancer Center, we have a great team of radiation oncologists that offer the newest and greatest uh, radiation to help the disease. It's just a little bit longer than surgery and it is extended over weeks, but the outcomes are quite similar. So those are the two mainstays of uh, active treatment for prostate cancer. And the fourth line of therapy for primary localized prostate cancer is something called androgen deprivation, which is a series of injections that we give in the office that helps control the growth of the prostate cancer, uh, literally starving it of the metabolic food that these cancers need, weakening the cancer, and uh, and many times making it more susceptible to, to subsequent therapy, particularly radiation. That is great information. So I'm hoping that a lot of people listening today are going to actually get really in-depth information into prostate cancer and the, the different types of interventions used. And you mentioned the Harold Lever Cancer Center. Can you talk a little bit about the multidisciplinary conferences held there? How do they help patients with prostate cancer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, again, that's one of the great resources of a comprehensive cancer center, and especially if it's local. It's not just for urologic cancer or prostate cancer. I think every tumor type has these collective boards. And it's a group of various doctors, and specifically in urology, when we do a prostate cancer or urologic cancer tumor board, we have oncologists, medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, radiologists, pathologists, and of course, urologists. We all get together and we discuss patients bringing forth all of our expertise to tailor a very good, aggressive, and appropriate treatment plan for that particular patient. And when you have everybody on the same page, it really makes that patient's treatment plan that much more effective. And to be honest, you have a lot more heads thinking about the best thing to do, which is really fantastic. And here at the Lever Cancer Center, that also allows us to expose that same patient's care to potential clinical trials or thinking outside the box and some of the resources that we have at, at New Haven uh, at Yale to allow for even more care. When you're looking at a problem, it's just better to have many more eyes looking at it than certainly your own. And it's a whole team that's affecting your care, not just one person. What if the cancer is outside the prostate? What happens then? The good news is we've actually gotten much better at treating and identifying patients who have prostate cancer that's beyond the prostate. We've gotten so much better that we're able to provide better life quality as well as symptom-free survival. We do that with really advanced oral medications that the medical oncologists have been using very aggressively and very successfully. But the key is to be able to identify that cancer. And one of the resources that we have locally is a very special x-ray that is called a PSMA PET CAT scan. And that imaging modality is very advanced, very specific for prostate cancer. Very often when we have these multidisciplinary conferences or if we're reviewing these cases with our colleagues, because we have access to the use of these PSMA PET CT scans, we're able to identify these patients earlier that maybe we would have missed years ago. But because of this really great x-ray tool, we have an ability to find even the smallest amount of tumor that extends outside the prostate. Great to know. Do you have any other thoughts to share with us today? Again, I want to thank you and the Harold Lever Regional Cancer Center. We're pretty lucky in this community to have a dedicated comprehensive cancer center in your backyard with people that you know to give you world-class care makes that battle against cancer that much better. That's great. I completely agree. My final thought is how prostate cancer is really not controversial in my mind. I think prostate cancer certainly is on this great spectrum, and I think knowing is probably the best key in combating it. Uh, we know more about prostate cancer today than we ever have, and we are much better at identifying these dangerous cancers uh, and therefore offering appropriate treatments for these dangerous cancers. But at the same time, we're much better at figuring out what are the less aggressive tumors and therefore offering therapy that is not necessarily as morbid or has as many side effects as others, including just watching tumors. I think that that's the whole goal is to give you a quality and quantity of life with minimizing any sort of side effects. So my message today is really for all the men out there, just get checked. You know, what you do with it is a, a discussion between you and your doctor. And so just knowing is probably the best thing you should do and get screened. And that's really the message that we want to get across that we're pretty good at figuring out what you have. And especially even in a relatively small community, we have access to the greatest and latest of prostate cancer technology and treatment care and, and take advantage of it if you can. That's terrific. 
Well, I want to thank you for being with us today and sharing your expertise. And we certainly look forward to talking with you again in the future. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Be sure to check out our website, levercancercenter.org, for more great content and new podcasts. Content produced by Lever Cancer Conversations is for the community and is for education purposes only. We do not diagnose, treat, or offer patient advice. Thanks so much for listening.